Something deadly may have once stalked the villages of New England. It was a very, very frightening thing. It was killing a lot of people. Historical evidence indicates people believed vampires were behind the series of deaths in the 19th century. Do strange graves investigated by Monster Quest hold physical proof of a creature thought to be a myth? I met a lot of people who claim to be vampires. When I feed, I can feel that rush into my body. I become very, very powerful. Using state-of-the-art technology, Monster Quest examines the evidence in the past. It might allow us to predict unmarked graves. All of these things can give somebody an idea that, oh my goodness, the body, it is still alive and tests two people who say they are vampires today. I have the results of her complete blood count. At one point, it almost went up to two. That meter I've never seen over one. Witnesses around the world report seeing monsters. Are they real or imaginary? Science searches for answers. On Monster Quest. In the peaceful cemeteries of New England, there is evidence of an ominous presence that haunted the past. That evidence is the word vampire. It is the key to a plague of fear that swept through small towns and villages over the course of more than 100 years, beginning in the late 1700s. Thousands of people were dying each year of a mysterious disease. Is the explanation medical or otherworldly? At least some began calling the deadly condition the vampire grasp. Loved ones are dying. You never really saw what was killing you. So as villagers started dropping like flies, they would go and dig up that first person that died, believing that he was the cause of it. The idea that illness is caused by dead people is universal. It seems a small step from the idea that the dead can come back to kill you. Legends of vampires stretch back thousands of years. Can science now prove or disprove their existence? To do that, you must define what a vampire is. Today we think of a blood-sucking count who sleeps by day and stalks by night, biting the victim's neck with long fangs. But that's a modern idea inspired by Hollywood. In ancient times, a vampire was someone who was undead, that somehow preyed upon the living, stealing their life force or their blood. In India, the vampire appeared as a woman with four arms named Kali. Legends in Malaysia describe a woman named Langswir with long black hair and nails. And in 18th century New England, the vampire was described as a person risen from the grave to somehow steal the life force or blood from the living. A vampire is something that, that can't survive without preying on others. Monster Quest will go to New England evaluating the evidence behind the epidemic of alleged vampire killings. The investigation will also delve far into the vampire legends of Europe, looking for the source of the New England phenomenon. Finally, the investigation focuses on the present, using medical and industrial technology to seek physical traces of vampirism. The New England investigation begins in Griswold, Connecticut, where in 1820, a man is laid to rest in the town cemetery next to his wife and daughter. His name is lost to history, but a pattern of nails on his coffin indicates that his initials were JB and that he died at age 55. JB's coffin is buried and forgotten nature gradually reclaimed the cemetery that contains him. Basically it was a farming family cemetery where they buried their dead in the backyard. In 1990, 180 years after his death, children at play in a gravel pit stumble across his skeleton. 
A full-scale archaeological excavation ensues, and the 19th century skeletons of 29 people are discovered. Dr. Nicholas Bellantoni, the state archaeologist of Connecticut, was first on the scene at the discovery of the bones of J.B. But when the team began to excavate J.B.'s grave, they made a shocking discovery. The evidence shows J.B.'s body was exhumed, mutilated, and his bones rearranged into an X, the symbol of death. The femurs, or the thigh bones, had been dislodged from their anatomical position and crossed over the chest area. It happened about five years after his death, and only to him and none of the others here. Instead of finding an individual skeletally and anatomically in their position, his skull had been decapitated and rotated to face the west. Also, his uh, ribs had been broken into. And the question, of course, we had was why. Because no records of who J.B. was exist, history cannot tell us why he was suspected of being a vampire. But science might. J.B.'s bones are now held in the Military Medical Archive in Washington, D.C. An analysis of those bones could explain his cause of death and provide clues to why such elaborate rituals were undertaken. And there are several other suspected vampire cases that also could offer evidence for the investigation. When I first encountered the, this vampire thing, so I thought it was probably, if not unique, just a very, very rare thing. The more research I did, the more cases I uncovered. It had to be a lot more widespread than most people would think. Michael Bell is an author and anthropologist. He's been studying vampire legends for 40 years. Bell has turned up an important new piece of evidence in a small Connecticut town called Willington. He and Bell and Tony together will pursue clues found in an obscure newspaper article from Willington, one of the town's hardest hit by a mysterious and deadly plague. So what is this new case that you said you've got? It's a, a letter to the local newspaper from the uh, town clerk of Willington at the time. And he's basically complaining about what he calls a foreign quack doctor who has been kind of pushing this prescription, this cure. The cure? Exhume the body and look for vines growing through the coffin. You cut those vines, you take out the vital organs, and you burn all that stuff. And that takes care of the problem. The letter writer claims he witnessed a local man named Isaac Johnson exhume the bodies of his two children to perform the cure. This 220-year-old letter is the only written evidence from the period that connects the epidemic with something otherworldly or supernatural. Bell and Bell and Tony need to find the Johnson children's bodies. If they can, the bodies could provide evidence why some of these New Englanders were believed to be vampires. They decide to head to Willington, where the letter originated, and where the Isaac Johnson family may have performed the rituals it describes. Uh, we want to check uh, cemeteries, yeah. death records, obituaries, uh, old newspapers. You know, it's a long search, but it's possible. Bell thinks New England's vampire beliefs may have originated in Eastern Europe. I don't think they invented it all by themselves here. I'm sure that this practice is European derived. It's, it's, it's identical to what's been done in Eastern Europe for centuries. The rituals there were inspired by stories told of vampires and passed from generation to generation. Is there any scientific proof of these vampire tales? At least one is based in fact. It centers on a woman in 16th century Hungary, a countess named Elizabeth Bathory, a real person born in 1560. She became renowned for her bloodlust, eventually becoming known as the Blood Countess. The legend has it that one day she was in a room getting ready. One of her handmaidens, I guess, got cut or something and blood ended up on her face. And when she wiped it away, she noticed that her skin was whiter, younger looking underneath. She became transfixed by blood. Blood is intimately involved in life and death. 
in sex, in giving birth, in cleansing, in healing. So blood is involved in so many human transactions that it has come to be understood as a sacred substance. And Bathory began a brutal murder spree, killing her female servants for their blood. So it sort of set something going in her mind that if she were to regularly bathe in this blood and, and really douse herself with it, she would uh, look young longer. And she started bathing in blood of her maidens. The biggest count is like 650 girls died in her hand. She was eventually jailed for her crimes and died behind bars. There is no solid evidence Bathory ever actually drank the blood of her victims and no way to scientifically test her for vampire traits. But her story helped fuel the fears of vampires already rampant in Eastern Europe. These fears led to mutilations of the dead to break a vampire curse. And there is evidence many of the European victims may have been suffering from a disease, possibly the same one that afflicted the suspected vampires in New England. Can medical science provide an answer? Until they die of their disease, uh, they exhibit these symptoms which might be confused with or attributed to vampirism. The investigation into the vampire scare in 19th century New England is focusing first on the only solid physical evidence ever discovered. The bones of a man identified only by the initials JB. An analysis of his bones may explain why he died. But why he was mutilated can't be definitively proven because there is no written record of him. But there is a record of another vampire case. This one in Exeter, Rhode Island. It took place in 1892, about 70 years after J.B. died. Newspaper accounts tell the tale of 19-year-old Mercy Brown, who died of a mysterious illness the same illness that killed her mother and older sister before her. Then she had a brother named Edwin, who got sick. Mercy's father was desperate to save his son, Edwin. People in the family and the community went to Mercy's father, George Brown, and put pressure on him, really, to come out to the cemetery and, and try this old folk remedy. They believed that Mercy had become a vampire after she died and was rising from her grave, stealing the life force of her brother. In New England, it was like an evil spirit was inhabiting one of your family member's hearts. And that evil spirit was drawing blood from the living to sustain itself. To confirm their suspicions, Mercy's coffin was exhumed two months after she died. They were looking for signs that uh, something was keeping this supposedly dead body uh, alive and fresh. The eyewitnesses apparently saw the signs they were looking for. They talk about hair and fingernails growing, the face being flush and red and full of color. This was all the proof they needed to act. Mercy's heart was cut out and burned to ashes. But that was only the first part of the ritual to break the vampire's curse. According to the newspapers, they uh, fed the ashes to her brother, Edwin. Didn't do Edwin much good, because Edwin passed away in uh, May. But was the Brown family really being wiped out by something supernatural? Or is there a scientific explanation for what the eyewitnesses saw? Mercy Brown died of what they called consumption. At least that was the official cause of death. Her body remains buried, so that fact can't be verified by the investigators. But in 19th century America, consumption claimed more lives than any other disease. Consumption was the original name for tuberculosis, an ancient and deadly disease that has plagued civilizations reaching back five millennia. Tuberculosis is an infectious disease that's passed by droplets of sputum that carry the tubercle bacillus. Dr. Lawrence Osius is a New York physician. Person loses weight, person coughs, person has fever, person gets short of breath, decreased energy. It's a chronic wasting condition. 
and you in the morning and there's blood on your bedclothes, blood around the corners of your mouth. It's something is actually physically draining the blood and the life out of you. Little was known of the disease at the time, and it usually spread from family member to family member. People understood that consumption was contagious. They didn't understand how. I can understand why people might make the association between consumption and, and a figure like the vampire. They're both walking corpses, living dead. And Nick and Michael have found another clue deep in the woods of Rhode Island that strengthens that theory. Although consumption's vampire grasp had seized thy mortal frame, vampire? The 1841 headstone of a man named Simon Whipple Aldrich labels him a vampire too. We've got actual uh, gravestone inscription that makes the connection between consumption and vampirism. But Simon Whipple Aldrich's headstone is unique. The only one thus far uncovered that connects the two. And with one out of every four deaths in this time period attributed to consumption, why were he and Mercy Brown singled out as vampires? Was Mercy Brown really just another consumption victim? Or was something more sinister plaguing her family than those of the other vampire cases? Bell and Bellantoni believe part of the answer could lie back in Willington, Connecticut, where the Isaac Johnson story took place. You know, in some ways, this is like the bookends. You've got Mercy Brown in 1892, which is, as far as I can tell, the last case. This is 1784. So that's, you know, 100, 108 years. The letter they discovered in the Willington newspaper was intended to warn the townspeople against a foreign doctor who had convinced Isaac Johnson to exhume the bodies of his children. They weren't uh, recognized as real medical doctors. They would just make the circuit, come to town, put an ad in the paper saying, I cure this or I cure everything. At the Willington Town Hall, Bell and Bellantoni hope to find records that will lead them to the Johnson children and perhaps the quack doctor who prescribed the unusual cure. Uh, we might find something on Isaac Johnson, uh, maybe his family. If we can identify who his family was, then we might be able to find the uh, gravestones. Why, like Mercy, were the Johnson children singled out as vampires? Bell and Bellantoni dive into the hundreds of handwritten volumes. All right, where should we start, Michael? Uh, let's start with the index. Okay. Uh, we've got names in the article here, so we are looking for Isaac Johnson. A lot of Johnsons in this town. Boy. The work is painstaking. But finally, Bell and Bell and Tony catch a break. Isaac Johnson and Elizabeth Beale. Joined in marriage July 15th, 1756. Wow. They have found a record of Isaac Johnson's marriage to Elizabeth Beale. The document mentions something else. The names of the Johnson children. Amos and Elizabeth. So Amos was 22 and Elizabeth was 19. Boy, that's it. I mean, everything. The dates are perfect. What Bell and Bellantoni can't locate is any more information about the quack doctor or burial records for the Johnsons. It could be that they are, are in unmarked graves. Farmers in this area buried their dead in the backyard sometimes and not everybody got a tombstone. But the investigators have an idea where to look for the graves of Elizabeth and Amos. And as they hunt for physical proof of vampires in history, the investigation will also employ state-of-the-art technology to test people who claim to be vampires today. When most people think of vampires, they think of dark castles and faraway lands vampires as ancient soulless monsters our understanding of the vampire for a long time was was that evil other that entity that had nothing to do with us it was a monster even if it looked like us it was a monster but vampires or vampire-like activities are not just found in distant places and distant times Nick Bellantoni and Michael Bell are in Connecticut, seeking evidence to support a vampire scare among rigid New Englanders in 1896. 
these people weren't, weren't just weird, crazy, fringe people. They were important, respected people in their towns. While these tales are thought to be legend, even today there are some who believe they are vampires. In the mid-1990s, Murray, Kentucky was home to a modern-day vampire clan with a taste for murder. Rod Farrell was a 16-year-old high school student who claimed to be a 500-year-old vampire named Visago. Farrell led a small group of teenagers literally called the Vampire Clan. Rod Farrell has followers who look to him as a powerful being. He and the Vampire Clan gathered nightly in a local cemetery to puncture each other's skin so they could drink warm, fresh blood. They've used this vampiric image to feel as if they are powerful, invincible, and they can get away with anything because they have these magical powers. In November 1996, Farrell and two other vampire clan members drove to the Eustis, Florida home of his girlfriend and brutally murdered her parents. He burned a V, his vampire mark, into each of the corpses before leaving the scene. There was no accountability for him, a supernatural creature, because he wasn't in the world of, of mortal law. He was beyond that, beyond good and evil. He saw this as a way to act out his anger and his frustration. Farrell, shown here at his trial, was caught, convicted, and is serving life in prison. He was diagnosed with Asperger syndrome, a high-functioning form of autism, but not with a condition called clinical vampirism. Clinical vampirism is a delusion that you need blood sometimes to survive or simply to be healthy. Across the globe in a small town in North Wales, another killer did seem obsessed with drinking blood. 17-year-old paperboy Matthew Hardman brutally killed his 90-year-old neighbor, Mabel Leishon, in November 2001. He cut her heart out and he put blood into a pan and there was evidence that he had drunk some of that. He put something by her body that was in the form of a cross. He believed he needed to kill someone and drink blood. Like Countess Bathory in the 1600s and Farrell, Hardman was convicted for his bloody crime and sentenced to life in prison. But was there a genetic basis for their obsession with blood? Or were they just tragically deranged? We can't test them, but we can test others today who also crave blood and don't resort to crime to get it. They don't like to always tell people who don't know what they're about, what they're about if they feel um, unsafe doing so. And when I feed, I can feel that rush into my body. As I'm taking that blood in, I feel the energy, I feel the power, I become very, very powerful. Joy Pulo says she feels a need for blood, but does not hunt humans or anything else to get it. We brought Joy to see hematologist Dr. Lawrence Osius in New York City. I'm a hematologist. Dr. Osius is going to analyze Joy's blood for anemia and any other disorders that might lead her to believe she needs to drink human blood. What I'd like to do is take a sample of your blood and do a blood count on my machine and see if you have any evidence of any hematologic disorder. Before he proceeds, Dr. Osius gathers background information about how Joy feeds, always from a willing donor. You obtain blood how? Um, I actually obtain blood uh, through an incision mm -hmm. uh, with a sterile blade, mm -hmm. razor. Uh, usually on the chest, uh, about an inch long. You ingest it, you drink it? With my mouth, yes. Okay, yes. so you drink it directly from yes, the chest? Yes, I do. He's ready to proceed with the tests. The sample will be tested by running it through a microprocessor-based hematology analyzer, which will look for abnormalities in Joy's blood at a cellular level. Those, like Joy, who consider themselves modern-day vampires, follow rituals steeped in history. But how much of this history is true? Bram Stoker's literary creation, Count Dracula, set the cultural blueprint for modern conceptions of the vampire. It was written in 1897. 
That novel changed what people perceived as the vampire. He wasn't a monster. He was someone who can think and act and, and have multiple pieces of real estate and travel. But interestingly enough, to make a good story, Bram Stoker had to introduce some things he created himself. Uh, one of the limitations was the sleeping in the boxes of Earth. That doesn't really exist in folklore. He just used it as a device to have his vampire be limited to certain crates so that way the hunters could destroy the crates and effectively trap him. So the vampire in the coffin is pure fiction. In 1922, the movie Nosferatu by German director F.W. Murnau gave vampires even wider exposure. When he filmed Nosferatu, he basically lifted Dracula illegally. Now, he knew he was going to get sued, so he decided the best way to protect himself would be to change the ending. So rather than have his vampire walk around in the daylight, in the novel Dracula can walk around in the daylight, he decided because it's a creature of the night, when the sun would rise in that climatic scene, you know, you'd see uh, Max Fred just like vanish. So even though some self-proclaimed vampires say they are sensitive to light, there is no scientific basis for it. It's a cinematic creation. Those two stories, basically Nosferatu and Dracula, account for almost everything we have today. But there are true stories that inspired Stoker. Like the 16th century Hungarian countess Elizabeth Bathory. It sort of helped fuel some of the legends that Bram Stoker worked off of. But Stoker was mainly inspired by Vlad Tepes, or Vlad the Impaler. He was born in 1431 in Transylvania, now a part of the Eastern European nation of Romania. He was widely feared for his cruelty. He was an amazing military genius. He lived in like the worst time frame imaginable. You were basically under constant attack from the Turks. He was basically put in a difficult position of ruling with an iron hand. Stoker got his vampire's name from Vlad's nickname, Dracula, which means Little Dragon. Now, it's interesting because all the vampire folklore are being staked in the grave. Um, the real Vlad Dracula actually used stakes that were upright, and he would put his prisoners on top of them. And it was a slow, painful death as you slowly slid down. Uh, and sometimes it took hours to die. And he would actually eat dinner watching these uh, criminals, uh, or what he perceived as criminals, being put to death. But no evidence is known of Vlad's desire to drink blood. Stoker appears to have made that up. But there is one other story that may have inspired Stoker. The New England vampire, Mercy Brown. She died five years before Dracula was published. And when Stoker died, a newspaper clipping on Mercy's story was found in his files. This fact makes the New England investigation that much more important in deciphering the vampire myths. And the best clues could come from the bones of J.B., which now lay deep in the archives of the National Museum of Health and Medicine in Washington, D.C., part of the Armed Forces Institute of Pathology. J.B. got to the uh, collections uh, after the excavation of the family cemetery in a town in Connecticut. The folklore surrounding uh, J.B.'s remains and the way that he was found in his grave site uh, where the bones were moved around after his death. If the bones reveal that J.B. was somehow abnormal, it could help answer once and for all whether vampires are an undeniable fact or a fanciful work of fiction. And this blood analysis could answer whether they share any physical traits with those who say they are vampires today. I have the results of her complete blood count. Investigators Nick Bellantoni and Michael Bell are in Willington, Connecticut, looking for physical evidence of the suspected vampire children of Isaac Johnson. According to eyewitnesses, their bodies were exhumed around 1784 to break the vampire curse. The investigation has taken Nick and Mike to a small corner of the town cemetery. We have not been able to actually find the tombstones of Isaac Johnson and his children, but we know Johnsons were buried in this section of the cemetery. The idea is they may be in unmarked graves. Now, using state-of-the-art technology, Mike, Nick, and their team begin to map out a 30 by 60 foot space, encompassing the Johnson plot that is strangely unmarked by tombstones. What we're doing here is trying a geophysical technique called electromagnetic imaging. 
Soil scientist Deborah Sarabian operates the GEM 300 machine, which uses radio waves to look for disturbed soil in the ground below. Below. It might allow us to predict unmarked graves that do not have a tombstone here that may be the children of Isaac Johnson that we're looking for. The graves could provide vital physical evidence to explain New England's vampire scare and help establish what the Johnsons, Mercy Brown, and J.B. all had in common that led their beloved ones to believe that they were vampires. The search for proof of modern-day vampirism is focusing on Joy Poulos, who believes that there is something in her genes that makes her crave human blood. Dr. Lawrence Osius is analyzing her blood to see if there is any medical explanation for it. He is using a hematology analyzer to test for everything from common disorders like anemia to more serious diseases like porphyria. Porphyria basically is a series of diseases in which there is a defect in heme synthesis. Heme is the protein that fills our red blood cells and allows us to exchange oxygen with the outside environment. The heme deficiency can lead some to crave blood. Though today, porphyria sufferers are treated with injections of blood products. In the past, a treatment consisted of ingesting blood. So the vampire would argue that, well, I have porphyria, and because of that, I need to obtain blood and drink it, and that will make my condition improve. The hematology analyzer has completed the analysis of Joy's blood. I have the results of her complete blood count. Uh, her white blood count is normal, with a normal differential, meaning the different kinds of white blood cells are normal. Her hemoglobin, hematocrit, and red blood counts are also entirely normal, as is the size of her red blood cells, and her platelet count is normal. Based on the results that I have here, she is in every way normal. There is no physical explanation for Joy's vampirism. But there is another type of living vampire to examine. A type much closer to the idea of the vampire New Englanders had in the 19th century. They are called psychic vampires. Like the New England vampires that were said to steal the life force of their victims, psychic vampires claim they feed off the energy of others. Michelle Bellanger says she is one of them. In folklore, everybody's idea of a vampire is this risen corpse that comes back to steal from the living that which they no longer have. Uh, it's kind of a hungry ghost. But vampires in the modern age have come to be understood as individuals, living humans who are not undead, who regularly and actively need to take human vital energy to survive. Michelle also believes her vampirism is in her genes. The vast majority of people in the vampire community believe that you're born a vampire. I had chronic health issues throughout my childhood, and so instinctively I learned to take this vital something from other people. That vital something was energy, and she claims it saved her life when she became ill in college. I ended up passing out in class. I uh, ended up getting rushed off to the hospital. There were tests. They realized that there were problems with the heart they suggested that I might want to start putting myself on a list for a heart transplant. Scared that she could die, Michelle returned to her dorm room that night and fed on another person's energy after avoiding it for months. The next day I got up, I was doing laps in the pool again. I wasn't just sort of okay, I was fine. All of the symptoms went away, the shortness of breath, uh, the dizzy sensation, uh, the heart rhythm problems, everything was gone. And as they say, I was a believer. Monster Quest asked paranormal investigator Dom Valella to try to capture evidence of an energy transfer during a feeding session involving Michelle. Valella is employing three different technologies to see if an energy shift registers on any one of them. I wanted to rule out everything, so I brought every meter we have. This is the FLIR. It's a thermal imaging camera. FLIR stands for Forward Looking Infrared. This model is the highest resolution thermal camera available today. It registers minute changes in temperature as color shifts. Blues and purple in the color spectrum represent cold temperatures. Reds are warm, and yellow colors represent the hottest temperatures. 
If there's energy being transferred from one person to another, that temperature difference it will definitely show as a brighter spot. Mm -hmm. This is a natural electromagnetic field detector. This typically measures a low static electric or magnetic fields. And the last meter we have is just a standard multimeter. Electricians use these to check wiring. You put a thumb on the unit, and then what it'll do is it'll read your, your body voltage. Uh, what we're looking for is any severe increase or decrease in energy. The investigation is continuing at the National Museum of Health and Medicine in Washington, D.C., where an analysis of J.B.'s bones is providing answers. Curator Franklin Damon explains how an aberration in his skeletal structure indicates J.B. most likely died of consumption. He has a thickening of the ribs. Thickening of the ribs is one generally accepted pathway by which tuberculosis can affect uh, the skeleton. So like Mercy Brown, J.B. was also a victim of tuberculosis. And judging from the thickness of the ribs, J.B. was sick for a very long time. Well, one reason why tuberculosis affects the skeleton, it's a disease that can take a long time for a person to die from this disease. A pattern is beginning to emerge. Mercy Brown, J.B., Simon Whipple Aldrich, all died from the same disease. But with consumption killing millions, why were these individuals singled out as vampires? This anatomist has a theory. Death is not an event. It is not a single point. It's a process. Meanwhile, at the cemetery, Nick and Mike are closing in on their last chance for an answer. You can actually see the rectangular features going east-west. Some New Englanders in the 17 and 1800s believed vampires were killing their families. The investigation seeking proof of vampirism looked to the past and present. This man discovered a two-century-old letter describing bizarre rituals performed on the dead. Most who appear to have died of consumption. This man unearthed a case of ritual mutilation and sent the bones for testing. This military pathology lab analyzed those bones for signs of any unusual medical conditions. This woman claims she is a modern-day vampire, but could not prove she's any different from anyone else. She is in every way normal. The testing of another modern-day vampire is revealing some unexpected results. Michelle Belanger says she needs to feed on other people's psychic energy to stay healthy. Paranormal investigator Dom Valella is using state-of-the-art technology to put Michelle's claim to the test. Rax regularly lets Michelle feed off his energy. First, all I'm going to do is really just kind of sync up to his energy, connect to him and kind of get a flow going between us. Dom uses the flare thermal camera to pick up temperature shifts in the subjects. Did we show anything useful? It didn't show anything about him heating up. Yeah. It just showed your hands increasing from an orange blue to now they were completely like almost a yellow. That's so a lot of energy went into your hands. The flare results are unusual, but not concrete proof of a high level energy exchange. The next test. A voltage meter will measure possible electrical transfer. Dom begins with racks. All you need to do is hold the unit with one hand. So you're reading about 0 0.032, just very normal. Next, he hooks Michelle up to the meter. So you are slightly higher. With their individual voltages registered, Dom then asks Michelle and Rax to hold hands to see if the voltage will increase. Is it increasing now? No, actually, it just sort of stabilized. It's at 80. 80, 79, 80, 79. Your average person is somewhere between usually, I think, 30 and 90. So even if it fluctuates within that, it's still in, in normal levels. Okay. So far, nothing abnormal. Dom moves on to the last device, the electromagnetic field detector. If there's an energy moving between you, there's a better chance that this one would read it over the other one. Initially, there are no significant changes, but then... Dom sees the meter jump. At one point, it almost went up to two. That meter I've never seen over one. 
right there is proving that somehow you are affecting the magnetic field. Even if it's slight, you still are affecting it. Because that meter normally doesn't move, it stays on zero. While the fluctuation is not conclusive proof of a high level energy exchange, it suggests Michelle is able to affect electromagnetic fields. Your average person probably couldn't just make that randomly move just by trying. At Willington's Old East Cemetery, Mike Bell, Nick Bellantoni, and a team of scientists are using electromagnetic imaging to try to find the bodies of the Johnson children. If they are found, then tests could determine if they had tuberculosis and if their bodies were mutilated. And that could be definitive proof that the vampire scare was just a misunderstanding after all. Once the entire area around the Johnson graves has been scanned, the results are downloaded. You can actually see the rectangular features going east-west. And these are classic Christian mortuary patterns. Promisingly, the scan also reveals similar rectangular soil patterns in an area without gravestones, possibly indicating unmarked graves. And I would say the next step would be to let's do some soil cores so we can look at the stratigraphy we would expect from a grave shaft. The investigators narrow in on a suspected gravesite and drill down into the earth one layer at a time. We have a lot of the subsoil mixed up into the surface uh, layer or the topsoil layer. Look at the color difference here. This is very dark, loads of organic matter. This mixing of soil indicates that Nick, Mike and the team are definitely standing on an unmarked grave. We have, uh, using the two techniques, demonstrated that there are unmarked graves here. We were able to locate at least one within the Johnson family plot. But there is a problem. Because it is in the family plot, they'll have to find descendants of the Johnsons to gain permission for a full archaeological excavation. And there's no telling how long that could take. In the meantime, Bell and Bellantoni will be pursuing more clues. So the trail's not really ended. It just continues in a different way. You know, actually, when it comes to science, the trail never ends. But science has one more possible explanation for the New England vampire scare. It may lie in what happened to the bodies after they died. It's important to understand that death is not an event. It is not a single point. It's a process. Dr. Jeffrey Laitman is director of anatomy at Mount Sinai Medical Center. Shortly after death, the muscles of the body start to give a condition known as rigor mortis, in which they are become relatively rigid. But by the time a suspected vampire was exhumed, the family would be confronted with a bizarre transformation. After the rigor mortis process ceases, the muscles will relax because they're deteriorating. So a body could move, and nails and hair could appear to be still growing. Not due to the fact that they're growing, but due to the fact that the tissues around them are retreating. Some bodies would appear to have recently eaten, and blood might seem to drip from the mouth. They bloat and engorge certain areas of the body, particularly in the GI tract areas. So even having material from the GI tract emerge through the mouth and this can have some sort of red tinge material come out. Bacteria, little understood at the time, also probably played a role. Also, as these bacteria distend and move parts of the body, the body can make sounds. All of these things together, to somebody who doesn't understand that this is a process, can give somebody an idea that, oh my goodness, the body is moving, it's changing, it is still alive. So what's actually a natural process may have seemed paranormal. But while the examination of present day and historical evidence could not prove the existence of vampires, it also could not entirely disprove it. Though the skeptics may have the upper hand for now, a final answer may not be possible until science comes up with better technology. And until then, those who believe will insist there are vampires among us. There was a guy in England about 10 or so years ago who definitely believed in vampires. And every night he went to bed with three cloves of garlic in his mouth. One night, 
a clove dislodges into his esophagus and he suffocates and dies in his sleep. Are there vampires? They got him. <laughs>